Hello, uh, good afternoon and good morning. This is Stephen Goldby from Erlang Solutions in London. And uh, thank you for tuning in to this webinar, uh, which is to do with really the systems processing and how BET365 in particular cope with uh, the massive peaks uh, presented to them uh, during the, the Grand National, uh, which is a traditional British horse race. And talking about that demand is going to be Andrew Dean, who's the Systems Development Manager at BET365. Uh, he's in Stoke-on-Trent and I'm in London. Uh, BET365 have been, uh, I suppose, Erlang users for something like, well, this is their fifth year of, uh, of use and uh, they have a number of systems uh, in operation. And uh, Andrew will tell us something about how they came by this decision and some of the processes that they've been through. Uh, and at the end of Andrew's presentation, uh, we'll have time for some questions. And I think there is a panel on the right side there where you can actually type in some questions, which we'll, we won't attempt to answer until the end of the presentation. Uh, and if we do actually run short of time, we'll still ensure that uh, everybody does get uh, their questions answered. Right. So in order to make best use of the time, if I can hand over now to Andrew, and he'll tell us a bit more about how he stopped worrying and learned to love the Grand National. Thank you, Andrew. Afternoon, all. Um, yeah, so basically, my name is Andrew Dean. Uh, I'm currently a software development manager uh, at Bet365. Um, I kind of cut my teeth in um, finance. Uh, I worked for... Um, a market maker and a, a stockbroker for uh, something like 13 years. Um, the uh, the systems that, that sort of market makers have in place um, are basically aggregating data feeds, formulating the price, uh, disseminating that price out to third parties, generating uh, trade opportunities, uh, committing the trade, reporting on that trade, and then settling the trade. Um, this is uh, an extremely similar model to um, sports, sports book trading. Um, so basically I moved to uh, Bet365 two years ago um, into the middleware department um, and it immediately dawned on me that the, um, uh, the scale of the operation is really uh, share trading on, on steroids. Um, what we see, uh, sorry, what would have been a busy hour um, um, in my uh, old life um, is the same order of magnitude that we see in a quiet second here. Um, it's just to give you a flavor of the, the, the sort of size and scale of the operation that we've got. Um, the moment I'm responsible for a, a number of uh, BET365 systems, uh, which include BET placement, um, some of the settlement systems, session management, um, cash out, which is a very important uh, system, a very popular system. Uh, and uh, the publishers, what we uh, use to disseminate all of our site uh, content. Uh, BET365 uh, ourselves, we, we're the uh, largest private uh, employer in Stoke on Trent. Um, we, um, so as you can see, we, we, um, we take uh, very large volumes and very uh, large sums of money. We, um, there's over 34 billion wages on sports last year. Um, we continue to see double-digit uh, percentage growth year on year. Um, we're extremely technology-focused. Um, we invest heavily uh, in, in technology uh, to the sum of, sort of 60 million uh, per annum, um, which has basically allowed us to leverage that technology and become uh, the world's largest online sports betting company uh, by a large margin. Um, we we kind of greater in size than, than uh, our two nearest competitors combined. Um, continue on that sort of investment theme, we've recently moved to um, a new multi-million pound office uh, on uh, an area within Stoke-on-Trent, it's the uh, rejuvenated uh, Festival Park area. Um, we typically, um, on a normal um, quiet day, we'll make between one and uh, one and a half million markets on the site. Uh, we support a number of languages. That uh, 18 figure goes up um, <laughs> regularly. Our transactional systems, the um, uh, 
SQL systems as they are at the moment um, run in excess of uh, half a million transactions a second. Um, we're a very bursty um, business and we, we can burst, as I'm sure you can read, up to uh, 100,000 changes in a second, um, majority of which are um, apart from our automated pricing models. Um, during a busy afternoon, so traditionally Saturday, um, we can have uh, two and a half million uh, users on site, um, and we service somewhere in the region of um, six million uh, HTTP requests a second. Um, one of the things that I didn't appreciate um, before I moved to the company is that uh, we stream more live sport than anybody else in, in Europe. Um, so on some levels we are uh, a broadcaster. Um, the Grand National itself is, um, for those that uh, aren't in the UK, is, a, uh, is, is the largest day uh, of the horse racing calendar. It's, it can be, um, it is the equivalent to, to uh, Black Friday really. Um, we see enormous, uh, there's enormous interest in, in the race itself. Um, it generates lots of drama. Um, there's uh, 40 runners, uh, it, it's quite a long race, so it's over sort of four miles. Um, the majority of the runners don't actually complete the race um, through um, tiredness or falling at fences. Um, and this can generate um, lots of uh, very exciting stories and lots of drama on the day, um, which means that it's it's a, an extremely popular race with um, uh, with casual uh, uh, casual betters. Um, from from the figures from 2006, uh, sorry 2015. It's estimated there was sort of two million uh, pounds, sorry, two hundred million pounds waged on this uh, on this one race alone. Uh, and obviously those figures will, will go up for last year, but we, haven't, we don't actually have the, the figures yet. Um, if obviously, it's a big uh, it's a big day for us uh, as it is for the industry. Um, we see lots of, of new customers arriving. Um, we don't help ourselves at all. Uh, we run lots of special offers uh, in the days prior to the race. Um, the race day is, itself starts uh, very early. Uh, people will, will wake up and immediately want to get their, uh, get their bets on for the day. So we see uh, volumes start to build from about um, nine o'clock. Um, traditionally, the, the, race, the race off is um, uh, quarter past four. Um, so we see a whole uh, day ramping up to, to the off, um, which Traditionally, it's been sort of like thirty percent increase uh, at the peak. the The key thing for us is whilst we're um, servicing this this um, uh, what is for us large but casual demand, um, we also have to service our regular customers. So whilst we've got the the race on, we're also um, uh, on on the sports book, including all our sort of in play markets um, spreading. Uh, across 30 classifications, over a thousand fixtures, up to 120 uh, markets on each fixture. Um, so you can see that as well as the, this abnormal load from, from the race itself, we're still supporting the um, millions of opportunities that there are on site um, at that point in time. And one of, one of the key things for us is to, is to keep the site functioning as if this uh, sort of huge anomaly um, wasn't happening. Um, and it, it's very important for us to give our, our regular customers um, the same experience that they, they see each day on the um, on the website. As part of um, placing the bet within the systems, there's um, um, similar to what I mentioned about um, market making. Um, there's various stages in the in the life cycle. Um, Making a price, disseminating that price, getting the opportunity out to the customers, um, being able to process um, their request to place, placing the bet, um, the customer the the option to uh, to cash out. Um, that's uh, something that's now sort of standard within the industry. We were one of the uh, forerunners to bring to bring that in, allowing customers to uh, take the money back, uh, having changed their mind, um, and then. Um, settle the bet and uh, update the customer's balance. Um, the way that we run these systems is we uh, we bulkhead these services out. Um, so what we we try and do is, is if we have any issues within um, those sort of individual services that it doesn't affect uh, the remainder of the system. 
Um, but what it does mean is that if we have failures within those individual components, that the um, that the experience for the customer is really degraded. Um, as you see, you know, if we if we can't make a price, we've got stale odds. Can't get the price out to the customers that stay large on site. Um, if you can't generate um, uh, opportunities, there's no markets to bet on. Customers can't make the requests. Um, you know, bets wouldn't get placed. If cash out isn't available, um, it's a, a degraded service uh, for the customer. Um, obviously, settling the bet is extremely important uh, to us, uh, and as is the, the, the withdrawal of funds. Um, The way that we handle um, the increased load uh, is basically because we, within the within the traditional systems, we we only have uh, a finite, um, uh, you know, we have finite resources and finite capacity uh, within the transactional system. What we've traditionally done is as the um, as bets and, and uh, fixtures move through the life cycle, um, we've managed. Um, to meet demand by moving capacity around the, uh, the systems. Um, this usually means by, um, basically we, we, we've got a, a ridiculous amount of, uh, of options so that we can um, prioritize bet placements against settlement um, and turn off various parts of the system should uh, like come under, under uh, extreme demand demand. So if, if we um, saw that some of the systems were, were being stressed, we will we will um, have a sort of graceful failure uh, of the system, uh, including sort of turning off um, customers' full history. Um, this is something that we, we really don't like doing, um, but in order to preserve the experience for the, the, the remaining customers and the remaining parts of the system, we, we bulkhead that. Um, it works well, or well, works well to a point. Um, is very nervy, and obviously we are, we are degrading the the, um, the service at, at that that point. The idea is is to to bring uh, the demand under control, so we, that we don't actually lose the site. One thing that happened this year, um, the organisers announced that they were moving the uh, traditional race start from quarter past four to quarter past five. What this actually means for us is that. Um, Saturday afternoon, um, at quarter past five, we are busy settling out um, huge volumes of bets that uh, are now uh, being settled and marked up as part of the um, football for the day. Um, it's our peak settlement period, so what they're simply moving the um, start time by an hour means that now our peak bet placement um, period is exactly slap bang in the middle of our peak settlement period. Um, there was a real fear around this um, on, well, on my behalf being uh, responsible for these, these systems. Um, what um, we, we do send, tend to see when we, get, when we go past being able to manage the demand is really ungraceful failure of the system. So we start to see um, Lots of um, locking and latching within the system. That means that we've, you know, those those synchronisation points have been overwhelmed. Um, we. It also means that um, we can't use the full capacity at that point um, because everything everything's locking. Um, that was it happens in traditional systems. Um, it gets even worse that once we start to get those locks, we get stalls within the database. Um, and once we're getting those stalls, what we'll start to do is apply back pressure. Once we get that back pressure, um, we get into the um, the failure feedback loop. Um, once we're there, it really does mean that we're going to end up um, what I like to call um, disgracefully failing, which means that the customers see this page and this page only. This is this is a bad day for us. Um, there was a real fear um, that having um, such large Demand at this point would would cause uh, would cause an outage. So as the day came to us, um, we were quite <laughs> worryful. Is is the word? Certainly, uh, I was. Um, but what actually happened uh, was nothing. Um, we really did have um, the perfect day. Um, the team 
that um, we'd sort of uh, assembled for that day uh, to monitor the systems and and um, and uh, sort of cater for for any uh, potential outages that we saw. We basically sat around monitoring um, our systems vitals and eating pizza. It wasn't good for for our waistline, but it was certainly good for us in that um, we had our record day. Um, we so as you can see, we were uh, sort of. 29% on the, the Grand National Saturday, we were 29% up on uh, a normal Saturday. We were overall, overall we were 26% up uh, on the previous year's um, Grand National figures. At peak, um, we were 42% up over a normal Saturday, uh, and at peak we were 34% up on the previous Grand National. Um, so it was it was an excellent day for us, um, and, and the, the, the sort of figures bear it out. Um, so really, you know, how how did we get to that to that point? Um, a number of years ago, we started to invest uh, in Erlang. Um, we began with um, a number of small, uh, smallish um, POCs. Uh, we we started uh, working uh, with well, they, they were uh, important systems to us, but they were um, we could turn them off if we needed to, or we, you know, we we would. And phase things in. Um, so we started to get Erlang into produ production um, in, in, in sort of small areas. Um, and then we kind of moved through um, some of the applications that we got and started to tackle more and more uh, increasingly complex um, problems where um, we started to, to use both um, distributed and non distributed Erlang. Um, as, as we approach those complex uh, problems, and now uh, we've got to a point where we've got a number of uh, business critical systems uh, are written in Erlang. Um, the one that made the difference on the day is um, a system that we call BETS. It is um, a multi-form, uh, multi-farm, stateless uh, application, which um, basically we uh, what we did is we took um, React DT and introduced um, CRDT support into the application layer. Um, a colleague of mine, Mark Owen, did a, uh, did a talk on uh, how we actually uh, managed that um, at last year's um, Erlang Stockholm um, conference. Obviously, the, um, the videos are up if you, if you want to go into uh, great detail of, of how we actually uh, managed to leverage um, React DT uh, within the application. <coughs> Excuse me. We use um, React KV um, on the back assistance, uh, and we fully integrated this system uh, into our uh, traditional uh, sort of transactional systems. Um, what, what that really meant for us, um, and what Erlang gave us, um, is really uh, sort of crux is the, the the increased capacity, um, the. Uh, the BETS application, the, 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 um, uh, each each application, each node of which there, there are so many, uh, handled millions of operations uh, in parallel on the day, um, which is obviously excellent for uh, for throughput. Um, I think uh, what I didn't appreciate um, until afterwards was that not only can we do um, enormous parallel processing, but what, what Erlang uh, actually gives us because of the um, the way in which it uses um, multi-core hardware, and it is it actually increased the yield from our from our hardware. Basically, we're getting more out of the CPUs. Um, the fact that we can spin up um, Erlang processes um, with very small initi uh, initialization times means that we can, uh, if we get any bet placement bursts, which we we tend to see, um, certainly as, as the run up to um, uh, with the run up to the off, we start to see it, it sort of ramp up. And if there's any, um, obviously you can bet in play. So if there's any um, events uh, that would cause people to want to uh, lay additional funds, then we can see those boosts coming in. Um, the, the the way in which Erlang initializes initializes those um, processes in very sort of short order, we can uh, we can respond to those um, uh, those boosts. Um, the enforced um, statelessness um, of Erlang, I know we can't carry state, but I'll brush past that because we don't, um, 
increase the throughput uh, of the system. Um, basically, we were unable, uh, able to horizontally scale uh, uh, the application out, um, which is excellent. Um, the one thing that became apparent um, through our use of Erlang in, uh, it was in a different uh, system to this, um, was the scheduling algorithm. At first, we thought it was a uh, was a problem um, that we could see pauses um, because work wasn't being done. What it turns out was that it was the it was the VM's um, scheduling algorithm was actually protecting our key processes um, from becoming overwhelmed. Um, if mailboxes become uh, large, then the actual producer is scheduled out, um, which, from a, a wider system perspective, is um, is excellent. We you know. We, we don't get into that sort of feedback loop because we're, we're basically moving, uh, moving the work away, and allowing the uh, the process that's uh, become uh, uh, or starting to run behind to actually have the, the CPU. Um, another um, sort of great thing that, that we see with with Erlang is um, even after sort of um, extensive periods of um, <laughs> sort of live soak testing, as, as, as we call it, in that we've got this unprecedented load that just keeps coming and coming and coming and getting higher and higher and higher. We don't really see any leaks, um, which is excellent because obviously we we want to we want to use the CPU, we want to use the memory uh, for doing real work. We don't we don't want any of that, that to be lost, um, and that kind of ties in with the, the sort of low uh, garbage collection times that we see. Um, Basically means that the, the um, CPUs are uh, being used to burn uh, to do real work rather than um, just simply burning cycles. What we also see oh, in, in this system and, and uh, others is um, real resilience. Um, the, the 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 sort of mixture of um, the um, Let It Crash philosophy and um, the redundancy that we build in an application layer uh, through the, the various um, uh, sort of development patterns that we use and deployment patterns um, that we have real system systems resilience uh, you know so we, we can we can cater for those um, uh, we can cater for those um, edge cases that we that we don't see and just move past and in the main we're um, we're dealing with the, the real work that we need to get on with um, the, the good thing about the um, running on the, the Erlang VM is that they were, allowed, they were unable to make sort of on the fly configuration changes um, when we do when we're dealing with such large systems um, and, and our sort of 365 um, by 24 operation we, we can't take things out um, Traditionally, we would manage this through farms, um, but it becomes more and more um, uh, advantageous, and th that we use this sort of on-the-fly configuration changes, and it allows us to maneuver um, maneuver the systems uh, in a, a much more agile way. Um, one thing that the, the um, VM and the console also gives us is uh, increased sort of uh, process monitoring. Um, we got. Um, lots and lots of st uh, statistics that we um, that we get out of uh, out of the systems and charting these uh, various um, stats allows us gives us a real understanding uh, of our uh, applications and, and the systems and the behaviours that, that that we'll see during these um, during these heavy load periods um, and for, for me uh, from a from my point of view, being sort of responsible for these systems, it, it's great to to have that insight into um, how the system is going to behave and how it behaves over time. Um, yeah, and one thing that I don't think, even though we we um, we didn't have to use it on on Grand National Day, but one thing that is great to always have in the back pocket is is the ability to hot code load, uh, hot load code. Um, there's been a, a couple of um, instances uh, during sort of normal, uh, not on, not on Grand National, but on, on a normal day where um, we've wanted to make changes very quickly, um, and and we've done that through uh, the hot loading of code. Um, it is a very very powerful tool, um, but you have to be careful. It's uh, was this enough 
enough rope to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so, kind of in, in summary, what um, what Erlang gave us through um, uh, through this uh, through the bet system and, and the sort of wider systems uh, within our uh, ecosystem is really increased capacity, uh, real visibility into what um, uh, the systems are doing, the um, real maneuverability in the, uh, the way that we can adapt the systems as we go, uh, and obviously we were able to eat lots and lots of pizza on the day. Um, so thanks for listening, um, and hopefully there are some questions. Well, oh, thank you much for that, Andrew. That was uh, very interesting. And, uh, it's not often that uh, some of the successful companies lift the, lift the skirts up a bit so that you can actually see what's going on uh, in terms of the processes that are involved. Um, we have had some questions, and uh, one of the, um, the first ones here is really to do, you mentioned REAC, and uh, I'm not quite sure who's asked the question, but um, in any event, I'll try and, I'll try and summarize it to a degree. Um, quote, I've heard many opinions on, on REAC. Some people say it's pretty good, and some have no issues with it. Um, you can guess what's coming here. Other people <laughs> say it's pretty good, uh, they have no issues with it. Other people say that they encounter endless problems with React when, they, uh, when the DB falls apart and the data becomes broken. Um, I would hazard a guess that uh, nearly all databases present certain issues, but I mean, what's your impression of React then? I mean, it's a pretty open question, really. Yeah, React is um, really stable for us. We um, we inject a lot of data into React, um, and we delete a lot of data. I think it's a, a bit of an odd. Uh, speaking to the guys from from Basha, it's a bit of an odd case in that we've got this constant churn um, uh, through uh, through React. Obviously, it's used for um, sort of big data um, uh, sort of applications. But we we. We delete a lot of data out of it as, as we're processing through, um, so we um, we're kind of using it um, right on the edge of where where it was designed. Well, I, I don't think we're a typical use case. I think is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yet it performs extremely well for us. Um, we uh, yeah we, the, the the sort of speed um, the speed in which you can put data in, the speed in which you can get data out, the volumes that that we put through it is. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's very reliable, and we've um, we've had various sort of operational issues where disks have been lost, machines have been lost, um, and we don't see any uh, adverse effects in, in, in the rest of the cluster. Um, occasionally, you might see a, 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 when when you have one of these um, events, like a, a machine disappearing, you'll see maybe a, a long uh, put time. And when I say long, it's, we're talking still sub second, but you know, that's in, and that's one put in millions. So, um, so yeah, we we really like React. Fine. Um, hopefully, I'm not muted at this juncture. Uh, I think that answers the the question pretty well. I mean, as I say, most most complex data storage systems are to be held <laughs> in some reverence in that, you know, yes, if things do go wrong, they take a bit of time to fix and sort out. Uh, but I think the, the notion, what, the gist of what you're saying, I think, is that, well, it doesn't actually go wrong very often once, you, once you've actually got the thing into the right operational situation. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And also the, um, you know, the, use of, um, the use of CRDTs. You know, we, we basically took, took the library. Uh, and start to use it, and it's safe to say that we, our application wouldn't work without it. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. And I think, um, yeah, as as Andrew said, that there is a. Uh, it's Mike, wasn't it? Mike was it Mike Smith who said who did the original. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, he, he did an original presentation uh, on CRDTs, and the whole thing is also related to the this guy. I think it's uh, Mark Shapiro in the, the yeah. sync free type scheme. So I mean, it's a it's a very hot topic on on a technology front. Uh, we, we we had another question 
um, which is a bit broader in remit. But as an Erlang newbie, could you please explain why you use Erlang and OTP directly and not Elixir? Um, well, that's a good question, actually. Um, we are we are beginning to take a look at Elixir, um, but I think it was felt that um, the, the sort of uh, the history of OTP and, and Erlang and the um, the number of cycle, you know, sort of CPU cycles that, that it's been through. You know, it, it is it is kind of tried and tested. Um, we whilst we um, we look at all technologies and we look at sort of young technologies as well. Um, we we do tend to go for proven technologies. Um, having said that, we are looking at Elixir, uh, but it just happens that we uh, we needed a, a safe bet. Okay, I mean that's it seems reasonable uh, to me. I mean, from the number, uh, sorry, that's <laughs> not meant to sound quite as condescending as it did. Well, no, but what I was trying to say was that from a from a, my experience of programmers who've encountered Elixir, it is very much first of all, well, why would I bother uh, in in terms of doing this? It is the importance of Elixir and its take up is very much related to the fact that you're not probably an Erlang <laughs> programmer or developer. You might think about problems in the same way, but you, you don't think of them in, in traditionally an Erlang nature. And for an Erlang developer to start using Elixir in earnest, I mean, they might do it possibly as a hobby. I'll get shot after this, I'm sure. But I mean, it, it, the traditionalists look on it as something that works well, very interesting. And it obviously uses all of the stability and the scheduling capabilities and the redundancy that the VM presents. But the yeah. important thing is that it allows people who aren't familiar with <coughs> the Erlang syntax uh, and development set tool set to, to, to migrate into something that is quite different. Uh, it, it, it provides some, and not all, of the same functional um, response or responses, uh, same functional properties as, as using Erlang would, but I, you know that's your point in that it's a new language by comparison. So yeah, I mean uh, bigger commercial firms that are doing information distribution can adopt it quite easily without all of the angst that people doing real accounting and <laughs> the possibility of losing money would be, have a bit more trepidation. I suspect is the um, yeah, in, uh, in in another another question here is uh, from I think it comes from what you said. Is there in the gambling world is this horse race actually the biggest demand of the year? I, personally, I find that that challenge quite well because I, I I do struggle to understand. I mean, you're an international company. So I assume that yep. not all of your users are based in the UK. The, the Grand National is an event in Liverpool. Um, is, is that really of interest to everybody else in the world at, at that level? Um, yeah, I think it's safe to say that the, the majority of the um, uh, customers that, that, that come on and, and are sort of wagering on the National are, are based in the UK. Um, it is a it is a large uh, day for us. Um, we we do have um, other days uh, where we see um, very large demand as well. So this this summer will be very busy for us. Obviously the the, the Euros are on and the, the Olympics are on, um, but we will see uh, we'll see large volumes um, on Champions League night, um, uh, just because it, it you know it's a it's a huge it's a huge event. I think that. Um, so, you know, hundreds of millions of people will watch that that event. Um, so that that that's a large large day. But yeah, it's uh, I think it's the, uh, the the national is the the, the you know it's a real sort of prestige uh, sort of marquee day. Um, so we uh, yeah we we see lots of lots of uh, new users. Right. Okay. Um, sorry, I was uh, I'm suddenly asked to show my screen, there we are. Um, another question, perhaps along the same lines, I mean, we're shortly heading towards, in Europe, the Euro uh, football championships, and is that going to be of the same nature then? Because, I mean, I was at some conference 
in um, uh, central in the Hippodrome in London, and most of the gambling companies seem really concerned about the volumes they're expecting from that. But I mean, from what you're saying, it's just going to be a walk in the park in terms of, you know, what well, can it be bigger than the Grand National? Um, yeah, yes, it can. In in that um, within the um, obviously it's it, you know it, it's a very uh, it's a very it's an event with with wide appeal, um, and the fact that you know a, a football match will go on for ninety minutes, there'll be lots of um, uh, sort of events within there, you know, lots of excitement. Um, um, people can people can bet uh, in play, um, so that you know if if teams start to, to score or, or run away with it, we, we see, um, uh, you know, bursts in, in, in traffic. So we, 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 will, uh, we will see peaks that, that will go, go above, um, above that. Um, but the, the, the thing about the national is, is it's, the, it's the, sustained, um, uh, the sustained nature of the, the volume. Uh, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the, the Euros, we will see peaks. Um, Having said that, you know there might be. <laughs> I, I don't know what the games will will throw up. Um, yeah, we could see. You know, we could see really exciting games. I'm hoping to see really exciting games. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not what uh, games. That's yeah. Ho ho hopefully, England will get past the group stages. Um, so we'll. Uh, yeah. We'll, it'll be good. Right. It'll be good. It'll... Right. Another question. Um, when developing your software in Erlang, do you use Dialyzer? And, and spec for types, or any other additional software for static code types? Um, we do use dialyzer and, and uh, uh, type specifications in, in places. We don't um, enforce it uh, across all. Um, you know, one of the reasons being that it's a dynamic language. Um, if you name your variables sensibly, you'll know what types are supposed to be coming in. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we, we, we do use we do use dialyzer. Uh, in, in various places, but we don't use it across the board. And on the same basis, I assume that you're not, you don't use things like, um, uh, I think, quick check or things like this for uh, testing by design. So it's not, it's not something that you build into it. No, no, I don't think. I'm pretty sure we haven't used quick check. I'll, okay. I'll probably be um, corrected, but I. I haven't heard of any of the guys using it. Right. Well, going on from that, we, we had another question that, I mean, I suppose it, it is a pretty obvious thing. If everything is so busy all the time, how do you actually test the, what you're putting into this system to make sure that it doesn't break it? And how do you go about testing the thing? Yeah, we, we have um, extensive test systems, really, um, that we, uh, you know, We'll functionally test something, uh, and then we'll um, stress test, and then we'll do real sort of destruction testing. Um, you know, we'll, we'll attempt to is put the put the new uh, changes under load, and then um, and, and then basically try and um, and destroy the system by you know being our own chaos monkeys really, and we'll you know, take out nodes, um, you know, re remove um, remove the network. Um, Split, split the system in half, sort of thing, uh, and, and and try a dandies to um, uh, <laughs> to break it. And it, it is a it's quite a heavy um, testing cycle that we, that we put stuff through um, because we're so precious of our, uh, of our live systems. That's that being said, the, the live system is it does throw up um, uh, anomalies now and then, um, and we have to we have to cater for them. And that Erlang's um, sort of late crash. Uh, philosophy uh, really helps us there, and that you know we can uh, we can move past that error and obviously fix the error. Uh, and hard code loading allows us to fix that in place. Um, it's not something that we like to rely on, but it is always good to have that um, sort of get out of jail card. Okay, um, and I suppose going on from that, and this is a personal question, but presumably it's like. The, the traditional telephone exchange, it never gets switched off in that you can't switch it off because that's basically what the business is. That's right, that's right. Um, yeah, we, 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 we just can't turn the system off. <laughs> then you know, It's very rare that you'll see those, those holding pages um, going up. 
Um, right. Now, are there any other questions out there? I've got one more here that is related to something that uh, you said earlier on in the presentation. And again, this is more of a, a generic question rather than the detailed one we just had about dialyzer. It, um, you may feel comfortable answering it, you may not. The question is, will you be expanding your broadcast services? Um, I don't know. I don't know, to be, to be perfectly frank. Um, I do know, obviously, I now know that we, um, we um, stream a lot of sport. Um, um, I, I don't know what the plans are uh, right. to expand that. Yeah. Soon enough. And I have apparently more questions here. Um, let's... I am struggling to see them. Ah, did you encounter any specific unexpected problems with Erlang? Any examples and uh, how you managed to control them? Problems? Um, no, no. None that I can think of off the top of, off the top of my head. There, there, there was the issue that, that I mentioned with um, the scheduler, um, but I think that was really our um, our understanding of what uh, the, the the scheduling algorithm of why um, if if a mailbox became uh, full, why uh, a process would be scheduled out rather than just um, going on with the, the sort of natural flow. Uh, obviously, that's that's. Uh, now the now we know that it's there to uh, you know protect um, the downstream processes uh, and protect the, the the mailbox from becoming um, you know it's it's unbounded after all at one point you're gonna you know memory is only finite um, so once we understood what the schedule was actually doing uh, and and the reasons behind it we uh, yeah we became comfortable with that and it just means that you, you know you change your uh, application design slightly um, and, and then. It's okay. Uh, a question from somebody regarding, uh, I think, build and distribution. The quote: Do you use any specific build system for building the Erlang software, like Mbar, or make file think, Mad, or uh, any other custom build stuff? Um, we have a number of ways of building. Um, we haven't, we haven't found. Um, a solution that kind of meets every application's needs. Um, so we, we've uh, really ex uh, experimented with a number of build tools. Um, I think I'm not completely au fait with uh, Elixir, um, but I understand that its tooling is, um, how should we say, more uh, more straight lined. Um, yeah, so we we're still kind of on a on a um, voyage of discovery in terms of. Uh, what is the best way for us to build um, build our applications? The thing is, our applications are so diverse uh, that one build system, uh, a build system for one, isn't necessarily uh, right for another. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, you know, we, we produce beam files and and ship them. That's, uh, that's it. Right. The the other part of that was, uh, is there a you know, are there specific things that you also use for distribution rather than just making? Um, in the main, um, we um, distribute through RPMs. Um, you know, we, we use a package manager um, to get them out, out onto the uh, out onto the nodes. Right. Okay. Right. Are there any other any other questions that um, that uh, the audience would wish to have? puts towards Andrew as we're nearing right the uh, build systems do you encounter any certs between uh, the newbie could you explain no oh, we've done that let's go back there has your development cycle shortened or have you spent more time on testing or less time what changed I think that's looking from actual um, the Erlang, uh, engaging with Erlang and using it. 
Um, yeah, it has um, the the, um, uh, the the sort of time to market has come down. Um, we do. Uh, it's hard to say whether um, we do we do more testing now um, because we've kind of always done extensive testing. Um, it is a it is a um, uh, it is a, a long testing cycle. Um, but yeah, the the um, it, it's difficult to say whether um, you know if if we program this thing in language X versus Erlang, would would this one application have, have been uh, developed quicker? Um, you know, that's hard to say. In, in general, I'd say it's come down a little. Yeah. Right. And I noticed that the, the question uh, regarding React had actually a, a bit at the header of it, which was to do uh, with Lisp or Lisp flav flavored Erlang. Do you have any views on that? I've never, never uh, sort of encountered it, but um, I, I used to work with a guy uh, who would rave about it. So, and he was a good guy. So, <laughs> he wasn't just left raving about it, right? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, right. So, uh, what IDE do you use for Erlang? Um, well, um, personally, I use the all, only editor anybody should ever use, which is Vi. Um, but the the Development team in general use um, whatever the um, um, favorite uh, editor is. Really, um, everybody's free free to use their own. So we've got a mix of um, uh, you know, Emacs and Vi um, and um, IntelliJ. People use, I think, some suckers for punishment use Eclipse. Um, uh, yeah, so the the full um, range really. Okay, um, we have done the build system. There was something. Oh, there we go. Uh, blah, 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 blah. This is the one. Uh, a gentleman in Thailand says, I'm teaching business computing at the university. I often comment that we should be teaching more concurrency and functional programming. Could you give a view on why, if you think these things are important, and perhaps what skills you look for in terms of what you're, when you're employing graduates? Yeah, um, I completely agree. Um, so Concurrent programming and, and parallel processing uh, are going to uh, are going to be the next 15 years, uh, 20 years, and probably more of the uh, of the industry. Um, you know, Moore's law has taken us to to a point. Um, um, now we've got to, you know, we can't get more speed out of the chips. We we're just using more chips. Um, we you know we need uh, we need to be able to uh, process them in, in parallel. Um, so yeah, so. Um, I've kind of, even though I, you know, I've worked in um, using various languages. I, I think coding in a functional way is, is the way that uh, is the way forward. Um, uh, I think it's the only way you can really um, stretch the systems and, and get all of, all the yields you can out of out of those bits of silicon. Um, as for um, what, what I look for in developers, is really. Um, I suppose to to quote um, Joel Spolsky, it, it's smart people that get get things done. So people that can, um, you know, uh, that, that can get um, uh, sort of head around the, the the concepts, which I don't think are difficult. Um, you know, passing state in, um, um, performing an operation, passing your results back, not you know, no side effects. That's pretty. You know, it's pretty um, um, straightforward stuff. So so people can that, that, that can get on with that, and then then show a real sort of um, Real sort of aptitude um, um, towards getting the work done. Um, over, over the last um, few years, we've um, obviously been expanding, and but we haven't just um, uh, recruited Erlang programmers. We've recruited good developers uh, and, and cross-trained um, into Erlang. We offer a full sort of um, a program of, of um, onboarding people, and what we're really looking for is, is people that um, have got um, good systems knowledge. Um, that you know that know how uh, a distributed system um, fits together and functions, and, and how how um, you know what what those failure cases are, and, and how to uh, code around them or not. Um, sometimes it's key not to code around them. Yeah, yeah I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for differences in approach from, from one pool to the other. Anyway, uh, yeah. one, one point I mean, I, on, sorry, just just a. So sort of ram a point home. I think I really, I really do wish universities wouldn't just teach um, OO programming. Uh, I think uh, you know 
teaching um, sort of sensible, you know, functional programming is, is where they should be. Um, you know, yeah. we don't need we don't need those hierarchies. We don't need factories. Uh, we need functions. Yes. Well said. And uh, <laughs> I'll send you on a mission to uh, <laughs> wherever next. Yes, off you go. Uh, right. So uh, there's another question that really followed on from I see this from, the original one was from Richard about whether the development cycle had shortened and had, uh, had you spent managed to spend more or, more or less time testing. The, the sort of adjunct question was: furthermore, how much smaller is the code base? Well, I'm always a bit dubious about this. I mean, if you hadn't written the stuff before, how much how are you going to know how much smaller it was? But if it was a similar application that was in existence, do you think that it is smaller? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it will be. The, the, the language is, is uh, much more uh, terse than, uh, than sort of, um, I don't want to pick on Java, but I will. Um, you know, it's, 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 Java's incredibly verbose. Um, you know, it's I've I've worn keyboards out programming in Java. Java. Um, so yeah, the the, the code base is, is much smaller. Right. Okay. Um, I think from the same person originally. What did they replace Erlang for? I mean, what in other words, what what Erlang replaced? What was in use that you then started to design and produce things in Erlang? That was the question. Yeah, I, th I think um, um, well, we we did write a lot of systems uh, in in Java. Um, um, one thing that we found, I think that um, people find found in the industry uh, also is that um, you know all I want to do is um, you know is is X. You know, I, I want to print something on the screen. I don't want to think about a complete type hierarchy. I, you know, I don't want to think about you know, all these things that need to be in place um, before. The, 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 you know, those things really do slow down um, development and, and you find people sort of, um, you know, disappearing in their own thought processes of, um, um, of what's needed and, and they kind of get away from um, you know, what, what we're trying to achieve uh, with, with the software, what we're trying to achieve as a business. You know, it's like, look at this beautiful type hierarchy as well. That, that's all well and good, but you haven't solved the original problem. Um, yeah, so so it, it was it was really uh, to to get away from that sort of um, you know that that my the the, the, um, the industry was finding itself in um, to get back to um, um, programming. I, I think it's um, I think it's Rob Pike's uh, quote. I'm gonna pinch it. Anyway, is in the object-oriented program is really the Roman numerals of um, of, of programming. Uh, you know, it, it served a purpose, but it's not necessarily uh, an ideal. Yeah, we've moved on. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we've moved. Yeah, I I, think, I see it as a diversion, and we've now gone back to where um, uh, to where we should have been going. Bold words, indeed. Right, I've. Uh, I think I've covered um, most of the. In fact, yeah, I think I've done all of the questions that I can. <laughs> I can see. Yes, that may not be all of them, but uh, I think they're all of them. Um, I think that's about it then. And unless you've got anything else to add, because I mean you've been more than helpful in terms of both describing the processes involved and some of the reasons that you picked up Erlang and, and ran with it. But uh, as I say, it's very interesting to hear somebody from a, a very big commercial company that's got all this stuff riding on it, and, and also from the person who has to sit in the chair by the screen uh, watching things and making sure that it does work. Uh, that's not always everybody's ideal in terms of it's often easier to write programs and then go away somewhere else uh, rather than have to be responsible for ensuring that they do run in, in a genuine operational environment. So good luck to you for that. Uh, well, but thank you very much for your time, Andrew. And uh, if there are no more questions, I'd like to draw the session to a close as we're, we're approaching the hour anyway. And thank you very much, Andrew, for, for the time and effort to put in for the presentation. If there are any other questions that people will come to mind for anybody in the audience, 
please uh, jot them down and send them off to the uh, the address there, webinar at erling-solutions.com. Myself, uh, or indeed Andrew, if they are of nature to Bet365, will be pleased to answer them. And uh, thank you all very much for listening, and uh, we hope to have you on air again, hopefully within the next month. All right, thanks very much and goodbye.